Good afternoon and welcome to this week's uh, Serious Security Seminar. Uh, our speaker today is David Enger. He was the Director, Information Te Technology Security for Rolls-Royce, and his talk is The Effect of Rootkits on the Corporate Environment. Mr. Enger uh, has been an employee of Rolls-Royce and its predecessor for nearly 23 years. Uh, early in his career, he served as several engineering positions, mainly in support of military products and services. In 1998, Mr. Enger uh, joined the security staff as the technology control officer. In 2003, he was appointed as the director of information technology security for Rolls-Royce North America. He's responsible for establishing information security policy for Rolls-Royce America. He is also responsible for conducting investigations and responding to incidents involving the company's information technology assets and supports the company's legal staff in responding to electronic discovery requests. Good afternoon. Um, as we go through this, feel free to interrupt me with questions anytime along the way. I think we'll have enough time to, to cover everything. Um, when I put the presentation together, too, I wasn't sure exactly what your level of expertise was going to be. So. If I go too fast, slow me down. If I start to drag, say, hey, we know all that. Move on, okay? We'll talk a little bit about the effect of rootkits on the corporate environment, and this is really based on a real-world problem that, that, that uh, we experienced about 18 months ago, um, along with a large number of other major organizations, particularly in the aerospace and defense industries, okay? Some of it you may have actually read about in the newspaper, but it may have been somewhat cloaked in exactly what was going on. Uh, does everybody know what a rootkit is? Anybody doesn't know what a rootkit is? Great, then we'll move on. This is the way the rootkit got to us. You have an employee, and they get an email, which happens all the time. We get a lot of email. Okay, You guys probably get a lot of just on your personal accounts. Can you imagine what it's like for some of our folks in the business side? But in this case, the email was from what looked like just a normal Rolls-Royce user and it had a subject line that was completely believable because it had to do with a potential employment opportunity on one of our programs that everybody knew we were doing. And in fact, the document that was attached to this was actually a company document that had somehow gotten into the hands of the folks that uh, uh, sent it back in and it had actually been used about two months before this was sent out to do an actual employment offer. Okay, so it was a real document coming from what looked to be a real person employed by the company. So, you know, a person seeing this, why would they be suspicious? And when they open it up, if you just look at the email, it looks fine. You know, there's nothing here that would necessarily draw your suspicion, with the exception of if you look at the title of the attachment. I don't know if you can see that or not, but uh, it's not just a dot .doc file. It has about three other extensions attached to it. It's dot, 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 something else. So if you were looking closely at that, you might say, well, that looks a little weird. Okay? But for most people, most users, most general users that don't understand a lot of the technology they should use it, it's just, hey, click away. It's a document. I want to see what it says. And in this case, now they're owned. Because, unfortunately, while they're reading the document, there's malware attached to the document that's beginning to execute itself and install a rootkit on their machine. Um, now, a lot of things could happen here to alert you that there's something wrong. Okay? A lot of our machines have personal firewalls on. That if, I don't know what kind of personal firewalls you all may be using, but it may have come up and said, hey, uh, service blah, 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 blah wants to connect to the Internet, and this program has changed since the last time. Do you want to allow it to connect? Okay. Now, unfortunately, when you have a lot of those firewalls, a lot of users see that come up a lot. So they say, "Oh, yes, yes, yes." You know, it's always yes. Okay. Um, there could be other indications that your computer is connected to the internet, even though you haven't opened the browser. But again, most users, they wouldn't know if that was normal or not because they don't pay that close of attention to exactly what their computer is going to do. So even though you know they may have indications, they may just think it's normal operation when in fact it's really not. It's really an indication that there is a problem here that ought to be investigated, and maybe you ought to call somebody to, to let them know what's going on. What could the user have done in this case? Well, just opening the email, there was no indication unless, unless you happen to know. In, in this particular case, the, the um, purported sender of the email had actually left the company about six weeks before. Okay? But 
not everybody in the company would have known that because if they didn't know this person personally, they wouldn't have known that they moved on to do other things. Um, but there was reason to be suspicious when you looked at the chief engineer uh, document, it was chief engineer.jsf.stovol.crw.q.doc. Now that's kind of a strange combination of extensions. And that should have gotten their attention. In that case, it could have called the purported originator of the email and said, hey, did you really send this? And what's this document supposed to be all about? Because it looks kind of weird. But they didn't. The way that we found out about it wasn't through any type of fancy systems, wasn't through any type of fancy, gosh, we got our act so well together that we knew exactly what was going on, is because the email didn't just come to people in Rolls-Royce. It was sent to a lot of other organizations. And in the document it said, if you're interested in this position, call so-and-so at this phone number. Well, so-and-so started getting a lot of calls from other organizations saying, what's this all about? And that's what alerted us to the fact that there may have been a problem. In this case, what happened was that the originator spoofed the internal email account name of the person who was purported to have sent it. Okay? Now, most general users wouldn't know what to look for in this case, and they didn't. They just you know, clicked away and, and did what they were, thought they were supposed to do. But of course, if you've ever used Outlook, and this is what we use and what a lot of co companies use for their email client for the users, you can find out where the email actually did originate by simply right-clicking on the email and going to the options block. And then what happens is that you can see the email header. And in the email header, you can find a lot of information. In this case, we can see exactly the path that the email took to get from the originator to the destination. And you'll notice that it goes through a couple of servers in the 132 um, range of IP addresses, those are our gateway servers. Those are legitimate Rolls-Royce servers over in the UK where our email comes in. Uh, and then you can see that it goes from the UK to uh, a North America server. But if you look real close, where I have it highlighted in green there, you'll see an address outside of the 132 range in the 60 range, which is where the email re actually did originate. And if you do a uh, lookup on that 60 range, first of all, you know it's not one of ours because it's completely out of the Rolls-Royce ranges. And rather than being something that, that we generally deal with, it is a publicly addressable IP address. Most people would not know what to do with that, but we do. And we took a look at it. And we did a, um, a who is check on that. And what you find out is that that originating uh, email address is in uh, uh, Taiwan. Okay, and it's managed by the uh, Chinese uh, communicate, Network Communications Group, which is a PRC-owned company that manages a lot of this. Now, it's a huge block of addresses, so there's no way for you to find out specifically who the originator was, but you can find out that it did originate in China. Okay, well, That's not a good thing. Um, and I think I just covered all this. Again, the user would not have known that other than if they knew how to, to, to look at the, uh, the header and make sense out of that information. And I think I told you about this already. And then at this point, when we received the call from IT, on the IT security side, we started looking at Internet activity to say, okay, first of all, how many people got this email? What does the email consist of? What kind of activity is the malicious code that's attached to it trying to perform? And what we found was that there was evidence by looking at our internet logs of data leakage from inside the company to these areas where the email originated. And we also observed that it was a continuing thing. So in other words, people did get infected and it was continuing on. Uh, leakers are going from Europe and from the U.S. and there were a number of clients involved. And as we started doing the investigation, we discovered that there were earlier undetected attacks of a similar nature. Okay. Because remember, like I said, we only found it out of this one because the users called us and said, hey, people keep calling us about this message that we never sent out. Okay? At that point, we declared a major incident within the company, and we disconnected everybody from the Internet. Because the only thing we could do to stop the data leakage to start with was just disconnect from the Internet. And we were just fortunate that this occurred on Friday so that our disconnection was over a weekend while we were trying to sort this out. So it didn't disrupt the business as much as it would have otherwise. Because as most companies, we deal, we, we rely on the Internet for a lot of things, including email, working with customers, working with vendors, working with partners. The Internet is a big part of our business. 
And we can't stay disconnected for very long without starting to impact the ability of the business to operate. We collected copies of suspicious email and the malware, provided them to Nixie, which was this, that's the um, National Infrastructure uh, Security Coordination Center in the UK. That's the equivalent of our DHS here, okay, for the UK. And to our AV prevent providers to try to look at the email and analyze the malware and see what they could come up with so we could actually see exactly how it was working and what we could do to, to prevent it or to clean it up. And we also took some of the client devices that had been affected and we did forensics analysis on those. What we found out was this malicious code, what it does is when you open the, the attachment, it starts dropping executable code into your temp folder. Now what it does is it drops a code there that starts the malware installation, but at the same time opens up the document that you thought you were going to see. So the user just looks in a document, they don't know what else is happening behind the scenes. Okay? And it drops some, some things into other parts of the system, in the System32 folder, uh, a number of different types of files that we found that uh, um, were part of either this particular infection or other similar infections that had happened previously. Now what we did find was that in order for this to work, the user that was logged onto the machine when they opened the email had to be at least a power user or have elevated access privileges. So if somebody was working in a lockdown user state, this would not um, uh, work on because the malware can only operate in the context of the user that's logged into the machine. So if the user logged into the machine is just a general lockdown user, the malware couldn't install because those users don't have the authority to install programs. But if it was somebody had elevated privileges, then it could install and, and, and it could wreak its havoc. Um, we also found it put a file called iExplorer.exe on all the infected clients, and this was a C++ based program that appears to have included <clears throat> WinRAR as part of it. And what we found was happening was that the, the um, uh, WinRAR was being used extensively to compress and encrypt data that was being sent back out again. And we found a number of other files also on there. Uh, at the bottom here, you can see how, how the files were constructed for um, dissemination back to the uh, perpetrator in that uh, it would come up and it would have some type of a number, like in this case, BK2X part with a, some integer, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, whatever it may be, dot .tmp. And what we found was that each of these files was about 500 megabytes when you, you would find them, and then that's what it would transmit back to... Um, IP addresses uh, back in China. Now, this is what the malware was capable of. And if you look through that list, it's pretty scary because basically it's got complete control of the machine. And it used a, a, a um, program called PC Share 2005, which is a command and control program, which would allow, once the malware is installed, the um, malicious code writer to get back and basically give commands back to the machine to do things. Now, what was interesting about this particular one was it, it was obvious that whoever sent it in had done their homework because internally it seemed that the malware was directed towards people who were working on specific technologies across the organization related to specific programs. It wasn't like everybody in the company got the email. Okay, So we're speculating that whoever did this had done um, some type of earlier attacks or something where they were able to harvest email addresses, harvest some type of organizational chart that gave them an idea of who was working on what so that when they sent it back in, they could direct it more than just blanketly covering everybody in the organization. Now, in order for the um, perpetrator in this case to get the information back, they had to be able to be a little bit um, creative because it's pretty easy for you to just go in and if you see them sending back to a specific um, uh, domain or URL, you just block that URL, right? So what they used in this case was they used dynamic DNS services so that you couldn't just go block a URL. You actually had to block ranges of IP addresses because the dynamic DNS would simply change the, um, the URL connected to the IP address on the fly. So you couldn't just go through and say, I'm just going to block uh, um, badguy.com because it wouldn't work because it would just continue to change where it was, where it was sending things to an IP address. And this just shows you some of the different dynamic DNS services that we were able to discover were being used 
by the uh, attackers in this case to get their information back. So what we ended up having to do was blocking wide ranges of, of IP addresses. So what, what it would do is when the malware got in, on and affected the computer, it would search for files on the computer and it could search network shares. So, you know, in our company, the way we do things is that when you get your user account, you have a personal network share where you can store data. And then you also have access to other network shares that are group shares for sharing data amongst different groups of, of um, um, work projects and things of that nature. So it could search any network share that the user had access to. And then what it would do is it would copy that data and package it up into an RAR file and then encrypt it and compress it. So it was about 500 megabytes. Um, and then use the dynamic DNS to transmit the data back to wherever they wanted it to go. They did a pretty good job on the encryption side because even after we got some of the government agencies involved, they were struggling with how to break the encryption to see exactly what data had been transmitted. And we still to this day don't know the full, full extent of the data that was transmitted, mainly because we've not been able to, to get into all these files and see. We can speculate based on who we know got infected and what um, access permissions we know they had, but we can't say for sure that everything or nothing of that went, okay? So what did we do to recover and prevent this from continuing on? We had to block a wide range of the, IP, the Asian IP address space, okay? And I mean a wide range of it. And we would not allow any email come from, to come in from those IP addresses. We would not allow users to go out to um, websites associated with those IP addresses, etc. Now this caused some problem because we have customers in this region of the world that we provide support to, we have suppliers, um, and we still need to be able to communicate with them. And so what we had to do is we had to set up a whitelisting process so that the business units could identify to us specific customers, specific suppliers, specific organizations they needed to deal with so that we could open up specifically to their IP address or their domain whether we wanted to receive email or be able to communicate with them. Now, where we've gotten into some struggles and we're still trying to deal, deal with this is that in China, even some of the regulatory agencies use the equivalent of Yahoo for their email. Well, that's a problem because we can't open up a specific address within that domain. It's an all or nothing. So either we can't communicate with them or we do the equivalent of open up Chinese Yahoo for anybody that wants to send us something. So we're still trying to deal with how we're going to, to uh, manage that particular situation. Uh, we also said, well, we're just not, not going to accept certain attachments through our email because this came through as macros and things attached to a, um, a Word document. And so we're not accepting macros anymore. We're not accepting executable files. We're not accepting compressed or archived files. We strip it in the gateway. Um, and that's caused some problems because, you know, people are just used to sending things in that manner. The other thing is that there were actually some business processes that some of the organizations had built to use macros and Excel spreadsheets and things of that nature to send data back in. We're now stripping those off, so these people had to find another way to work around to manage that, that business process that previously had relied on macros in an Excel spreadsheet. We also uh, looked around and for any client device in our networks that was trying to connect to any IP addresses in the suspect range. And those we removed from the network. We examined the drives looking for the root kits and any variants of those root kits. And in many cases, rather than just clean the drive and reuse it, we just trashed the drives. It was just a lot easier than trying to deal with were we really able to clean it up. You know, you can do a lot of low-level formatting, but uh, you just never really know for sure on some of these, and so we just end up tracing a lot of the drives. It's a really an inexpensive way to protect yourselves because drives are cheap. Um, the other thing we did was we set up a centralized program to push um, the F-Secure Client Security Suite out to all of our devices. Previously, we had personal firewalls on the laptops, um, and we had a antivirus, but they weren't... Um, they were two different programs, and they weren't centrally managed. Uh, so we went to central management and pushed the F-Secure Client Security Suite out, which has the, uh, the uh, client firewall, antivirus, anti-spyware, all that stuff embedded in it. And 
we installed the uh, update servers and stuff internally so that we can push the updates out and make sure that the clients get the updates. Um, that's helped a lot. We also did something that really made our users happy. We took away a lot of their access privileges. We had a lot of users, in fact, almost every laptop user had full administrative access to their laptops up to this point. They don't anymore. Um, and this has been a lot of work for us and a lot of hassle for some of our users. We basically said everybody loses their administrative access. If you need it back, you need to provide a business justification for why you need it. And it has to be endorsed by your supervisor. And then we'll look at that and we'll make a decision in the IT security community whether or not you're going to get it or not. This has been a, a real, real big problem. Uh, and where we really have found a lot of, of issues with this are on our people that are out there supporting the customer directly. Because they end up with programs and things that may be written by um, the control system supplier or somebody of that nature to troubleshoot their control system. Or they may show up if they're supporting a, a ship, they may show up and and the ship builder hands them a new CD that day, so here's the new troubleshooting program for the ship, and you got to plug into our, our uh, Ethernet port here to do your troubleshooting of the power system back there. Okay, So these guys get into situations where they have to load stuff that we have no clue what it is because it's not a commercial product that we push out through our systems all the time. So we had to have a way to accommodate that, but we really didn't want to give them full administrative access on their network accounts. So what we did was to create what we call a run-as account. Basically, it gives them a second account. And this account usually is like their ID preceded by an RA for run-as. That account has access privileges, full access privileges to their device, but has no network privileges. So they can get on their device, load software, or use software that, that may require access to registries and things of that nature that you wouldn't normally get access to. But they can't get on the email system. They can't get on other network shares, things of that nature, with that account. So that kind of limits the exposure to just the device. It still has exposure, but it's limited, it's, it, and it wouldn't uh, give the uh, attackers the opportunity to do what they did previously. Um, we also looked at some way to alert the users to problem email. Because remember, this is a spoofed email that to the user population looks like it was generated internally by a Rolls-Royce user. But it actually came in through our gateway. Well, the gateway shouldn't really accept email that looks like it was generated internally, but it came from the outside. I mean, that's just kind of like a common sense thing when you think about it. But most gateways aren't set up to look for that. And sometimes it's not that easy to, to detect. Then you run into a problem where a lot of us now, we've outsourced things. We've outsourced things like a lot of our uh, strategic recruiting. We've outsourced things like our learning management system. And these systems, though, have the authority to send email on behalf of Rolls-Royce using the Rolls-Royce.com reply to addresses. And sometimes those emails have to come inside. So you kind of have a catch-22. You don't want to accept any email like that, but you have to accept mail like that because you've built business processes that require it. So what we do now is if there's an email that comes into the gateway that's purported to be a Rolls-Royce.com reply to address, it comes up, and as you see here, it says external sender. This is actually a piece of uh, uh, malware that I just got the other day that uh, tried to come in. And, uh, uh, the malware was stripped. But uh, you see what it says. It actually came from me, if you notice. It was me emailing to myself, apparently. Um, which just shows you that they still have the addresses out there and they're still trying to spoof us, okay? But you see where it says caution external sender? That now goes in the subject line of any, ad, of any email that comes in where it looks like it was generated by Rolls-Royce address, okay? So that gives the user at least some cautionary um, uh, message that says, hey, pay attention, this might not be what it seems, okay? So if you weren't expecting it, it doesn't look like a LMS type of message or something, you probably just want to use a delete key pretty judiciously in, uh, on those, okay? So that gives at least the user some ability to have a, a little bit of control over the environment, a little bit of control over what's going on. It's caused some pain for the business. It's, been, it's taken them some time to, to come to grips with this, but they are starting to understand, especially after they see some of the newspaper items like the DOD getting hit with the same thing and, and other companies getting hit that they're talking to. They know that we're not just making this stuff up. It really is true. 
We do continue to get attacked with malware, but we're getting a lot of it stripped at the gateway, and the users are being warned. So up to this point, we've not had any further successful attacks that, we're not, that we know about, and we're watching our internet logs a lot more closely now. So we're pretty confident that we're not getting hit, that the protection measures we've put in place, along with some other tweaking that we've done of our systems, has protected us from further attacks of this nature. It was, there was impact on the users, obviously, because the users had to learn to deal with new processes and things. It's become a little bit more difficult for some of them to do their job, but they are adjusting, and we're trying to, to uh, give them as much support as we can. Um, where we found this has been a bit of a challenge has been a lot of our new employees, especially those that just come out of college, mainly because they grow up in an environment that tends to want to be more open and sharing, and they come to work and say, ah, nope. No open and sharing here. We're closing you down, and you only get to do what you need to do for your job. No I am, no Rhapsody, you know, do your job. Don't worry about the rest of that stuff, okay? And that's a bit of a, uh, of a change for a lot of them. And uh, uh, so I just wanted to throw this in as a reminder, because you all are going to be back out there again in the work environment if you're, if you're not already. And, and uh, it's generally not employees just trying to be mean. It's there's good reasons why we put the security controls in place, and this is a good example of why we've been able, been, it's been necessary for us to do this. And also through here, here at the end, this is just some lessons for you to take home with you, because I find that even being the security guy, I can't get my wife and kids necessarily to listen to me when I tell them what they ought to be doing with their computers. And sometimes they have to see by, by disastrous example uh, what uh, uh, the situation is. Of course, they don't let them connect to my network either. But, uh, um, you know, these things that happen to, to companies are also being done to individuals, all right? You're getting the same type of malware. It may not be coming from the same source, but it's coming with the same intent, and that is to steal data from your machine. They don't know what the data might be, but that's what they're trying to do, okay? So a lot of this is, is, is on these free hosted sites. You go out to free, oh, look at these great view, new videos you can get for free, or this, hey, great music download, you get it for free, okay? There's really nothing free on the internet, okay? Somebody's paying for it somewhere. It's either they've got embedded advertising, or they've embedded other little goodies, okay? And you might think, well, why would anybody want to attack my computer? What do I have on there everybody cares about? Well, when's the last time you got on Amazon.com and, and uh, bought something? Or did your internet banking? Or maybe you're sending out resumes that have your personally identifiable information on them so that somebody can maybe steal your identity. There's all kinds of things on your computer that you probably don't realize that are there that would be of value to somebody who had that intent. So... Take care of where you go and watch what you download. Like I said, nothing's ever really free on the Internet. Somebody's paying to have that stuff hosted someplace, and they're paying for it by what you're downloading. Make it a practice to operate your computer in a reduced privilege state. Unfortunately, when you buy your software and you load it up, generally the software loads with full administrative access. And in fact, the account that comes up says admin usually. Okay, that should be a clue. Uh, you want to do something about that, and the first thing you should do is create a user account that has reduced privileges and operate with that account unless you need to load software. That will keep a lot of this stuff from being able to load on your machine and successfully infiltrate your machine because, again, remember, any program that wants to load or operate on your machine can only operate in the context of the logged in user. If the logged in user is using an admin account, it has full access to your machine. If the logged in user, those using a restricted account, it can't do anything other than just sit there and hope it could do something else. All right? So that, that helps you a lot. And, of course, you want to make sure you keep your computer up to date. And if you're not the kind of person that likes to go out and check for the updates on your own, then just turn on the automatic updates and let Microsoft do it for you. I know a lot of people, oh, Microsoft, can't let them do, touch my machine. It's better than not getting it updated. All right? You're a lot better off letting them update it for you than not having it updated at all. Also, when you get those nice little messages that come up and says, XXX program has decided to stop and or has caused an error to, and, and must be stopped. Do you want to tell Microsoft about it? Okay? I would encourage you to say, yes, send the information. We had the um, 
Microsoft security guys in a while back, and what they told us was they, they actually they have a very large staff that looks at those error messages when they, when they come in and actually tries to figure out what's causing the problem. And what they find is the vast majority are called, caused by malware. The vast majority are caused by malware. The next biggest hit after that is video drivers. Okay, So send them in because a lot of times what Microsoft will do then is they look at the stuff that comes in and they can see where the problems are and the next update pack they actually send out things to remove that malware. Okay, You don't know they're doing that. They don't tell you they're doing that, but they are doing that. Okay, So send that stuff in because that does help them and helps all of us because when they put it in to, re to remove it, it removes it from everybody whether you knew you had it or not. Okay. And I think that's everything I have. Um, and we have a few minutes left, so any questions, comments? Yes? Dave, um, you, you shared this case study that happened in Rolls Royce. How prevalent, or do you have any information that shows that uh, this is happening at, at your peers that are also in the defense industry? Well, um, I can't give you specifics. What I can tell you is that as a result of these issues over the last 18 months, what we have done is that uh, a number of us have come together um, on our own as companies and formed the Defense Security Information Exchange. Um, and this includes about 50 or 60 different defense companies, and all for the purpose of being able to share more easily these events when they come up and alert one another to them because we're all being hit by the same thing. Uh, the Air Force has been very heavily instrumental in pushing a specific um, military similar consortium because they were concerned about particular Air Force programs that were being affected by this. Okay. Now what's happened since that is that the Defense Industrial Board, which is basically a, uh, a board made up of major contractors and the DOD, has put together what is called the CPAC, which is the um, Critical Information Protection uh, something else committee. Anyway, CPAC has taken a big interest in this, and the Air Force program is, is merging into the CPAC program, and most of the big defense contractors are part of that. And again, it's mainly to get the endorsement. If we can get the endorsement from DOD for us to share information, it makes it a lot easier to be able to do that without having to run afoul of antitrust laws and things of that nature. You always kind of get, people kind of look askance when they see all these contractors together talking to each other because they start thinking antitrust, collusion, and things of that nature. What we're really trying to do is share information of the security nature so that if one of us gets attacked, everybody else doesn't have to get attacked before they find out about it. So yeah, there, there's, there's evidence from that standpoint. I've talked to some of their security folks. I know they've, they've been through the same thing, but I can't give any specifics on that without violating their trust. Would you make, would it be safe to make assumptions um, from a layman's point of view that this may be similar to what's been in the newspaper recently, the news stories about uh, the non-secure networks in the Pentagon? And, I, and, I'm, and I'm not assuming that you have any direct information, just, just as an expert who's had to deal with this on the corporate side, would you suspect that this may be something similar? Yes, I would suspect that it would be something similar because uh, the non-secure nipper net side, they call it, uh, of the DOD, um, is probably run a lot like commercial enterprises are. And um, looking, and I'll kind of deviate here a little bit, in my other life, okay, I'm a member of DOD, I'm an Air Force Air Guard officer, okay, so I have to deal with when they come out with some of their draconian changes because of reacting to something, I get hit with it on that side too. And we have had some... Um, must change your password immediately uh, issues that have come up and they've gone to uh, uh, more extensive requirements for passwords all in the last year or so. So I think you could probably put two and two together and come to a conclusion that they're seeing the same things we're seeing. Yes? This whitelisting process that you mentioned, is that something that's reasonable you think in a business to implement, uh, not just particularly for Asian net blocks, but Is that an honors process or just a through? So there are, um, it's... Will you, will you somewhat repeat the, the question? Oh, okay, yeah. The question, question uh, was about whitelisting, whether or not that was an onerous process or something that, that could be rationally, reasonably implemented in a, in a commercial enterprise. 
Um, yes and no. Okay. A lot of it depends on the users being able to let you know they have an issue with a company that needs to be whitelisted. That's usually your biggest problem is that users don't understand that the, there's a requirement for the process. And so what happens is they say, I'm not getting my email. Well, they're not getting their email because the address was in a blocked range and they didn't tell us about it. And so it may take them some days to figure out, oh, wait a minute, maybe I should have told you about, you know, to chase down what the problem was. Once you know what the problem was, it's not a very onerous process, but it does take manpower and effort. Okay, and that's where the problem comes in. That it, you you always have to have somebody look at it and say, yeah, okay, we approve this, and then somebody else has to implement it. Now there are tools out there to make that easier. Um, how many of you have uh, ever tried to email the IRS? Okay, I know it's not the most fun thing to do, or even the most fun thing to think about. But I do recall about 18 months ago, for whatever reason, I I was trying to do something with them. I can't remember what it was. I'm still free, so it must not have been too bad. They haven't put me in jail. Uh, but anyway, I wanted to email somebody there, and what happened was they had an automated system that they had to do something with their automated system before it would allow me to email somebody inside the IRS. So there are automated systems out there that do some level of these whitelisting checks that, that uh, um, can be implemented. Now, most companies haven't because it is uh, probably not cheap. But quite frankly, I think you're going to see more and more of that. I think what you're going to see more and more of is rather than a allow all and deny by exception, it's going to be deny all and allow by exception. And you're going to see everybody work into whitelist or something similar to that because this spam issue is just getting so bad and the malicious code that's being embedded in it is getting so onerous that companies just aren't going to deal with it anymore. It's, not, it's just too expensive to deal with. We're looking right now, we're, there's a company called uh, Ironport, which is owned by Cisco, that makes a nice little device for um, email gateway control. And we're looking at right now putting that in, and we've got it running right now in monitor-only mode, and we have found by just monitoring and just doing reputation checking, where reputation checking is, it looks at the IP address of the sender, looks at the rich registry of known bad stuff, no bad addresses and stuff, and sees if the, if the address matches the domain, just doing that, we're finding 80% of the email coming in is going to be stopped right there. 80% of the email we're receiving is trash before you even look at it. Okay? Why should we, and then we're talking millions of messages a day in this case. Okay? Why do we have to deal with that? Why do we have to spend a couple hundred thousand dollars to put this thing out there to do that work? All because of spam and malicious code. So if we go to a deny owl, we can get rid of a lot of that stuff and simplify our systems and our networks and, and the size of them. And I think you're going to see more and more companies start looking at that. Yes, sir. Uh, you said that, uh, that you destroyed the hard disk uh, crash. Then. Uh, how do you do that? Well, we have a couple of different methods, okay? Um, and it depends on, on um, uh, how uh, sensitive we feel the data may have been on it. We may just degauss it and then trash it. Or we may send it send to a shredder. Just depends on on uh, how nervous we are about what data may be. Degauss. Yeah, basically you just like run a magnet over it. Okay. Yeah, we we do our best to make sure that when it's destroyed, it's destroyed, and you're not going to find it on eBay. And we have a similar process we do when we retire machines. We do something similar when we just retire machines because, uh, you know, that is a big problem. Uh, when you're looking at a user population in the tens of thousands, that means that you're, just, you're probably retiring machines on a daily basis because you're refreshing on a three or four year cycle. You've got to be doing this on a regular basis. You've got to have a process to do it, or you will find your hard drives on eBay with all kinds of nice information. Any other questions? We've got a, what, a couple more minutes here. All right. Well, thanks for your attention. And uh, hopefully I gave you some things to think about, if nothing to scare you half to death. But I know you're all going to go home tonight and make sure your machines are updated and get rid of your administrative accounts and lock everything down, right? <laughs> Mr. Anger, thank you very much for joining us today. Appreciate thank it. You. We do have some time. If you wanted to uh, informally ask a question afterwards, you do have some time.